Welcome back to the Engadget stage live from CES in sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is Michael Gorman. I am the editor-in-chief of Engadget. Uh, my, the man sitting to my left doesn't really need any introduction, but I will anyway. Master illusionist, David Copperfield. Thank you for joining us on stage, David. So good to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next to David, we have his executive producer, Chris Kenner. Thank you for joining us, Chris. Yeah, you're, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. And lastly, we have deputy managing editor of Engadget, James True. How are good you, morning. James? All right, well, David, so uh, for some folks at home, this might be a little unusual to them, but I know you come to CES. This is not your first one, so why do you come to CES? Uh, I think for the same reason everybody does, to, to be inspired. You know, for me, it's to be inspired to see what's new out there, the way things are, are being thought of uh, in a new way. Um, magic has uh, been kind of commingled with technology for so many years and so many centuries. And, um, and I've, I, I, I take things that I see here and try to incorporate them into my, into my show, to my work, disguise them. Right, of uh, course. Um, so that uh, even the inventors uh, and the creators won't recognize those things uh, if I do my job right. Yeah. Uh, historically, uh, magicians have been part of the creative team, part of this technology. Uh, you know, inspiring cinema, inspiring uh, uh, new invention, new new ideas, uh, and uh, I'm part of that world, and I feel a responsibility to to kind of carry that forward, and, and uh, we we do. Right, and and I know you are kind of you have the world's largest collection of kind of uh, magical historical artifacts, and we've got some of them right here. So, can you tell us a little about what what we have in your collection in general? Well, you know, uh, if the father of modern magic is named a guy named Robert Houdin. And Robert Houdin uh, invented, he was a clockmaker, was an inventor of many things. Uh, he invented, uh, well, by being a clockmaker, he and being a magician as well, he combined the two things and, and, and created mystery clocks. And uh, Chris, why don't you show this first one? This is a, what they thought was amazing was this. Oh, well, at first, you have to realize this is the 1830s. So back then, a, a miracle would just be the fact that this clock face is thin. He took the mechanism and put it here, and then had gears and gears, and then the clock face would be up top. Eventually. What's, 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 what's amazing is even, even then, the fact that a clock had so much mechanics, the fact that it could be that, turn it sideways so I can really see, that thin was a big revelation. In, in, in the 1830s, incredible. And that was the rage. And then he took it one step further. And then he makes this one, which is called a mystery clock, which is even more mystery, because back then, you know, people didn't have any understanding of technology like we do now. So this one is, all the mechanism is, is down here, mechanism is down here. The clock face has two panes of glass. There's a front pane, and it has the numbers painted on it. There's a back pane, and the back pane has a little gears, grooves cut in the back of it, right here. And there's gears here, gears go down. This back pane can spin, and the um, handle, the hand, is attached to the back pane. So when the back one spins, it looks like it's magically spinning in air. So that, in 1830, this was quite something. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And the effect, the effect was that you had a disembodied kind of hand that would be moving telling time even though it was connected to a piece of glass. Right. But the logic behind it was the fact that the numbers were on the front not moving and the back piece of glass was moving connected to all these little, through these very thin spaces around here. So that was, and Cartier in fact, the Cartier company kind of took this and made it their own but they missed the point. They took the numbers and put it on the outside of the area. So. It didn't use it lost, a magician. it lost yeah. its real essence because they weren't thinking like a magician thought. Right, right. So and then I'm, Houdin. Uh, yes. No, no, sorry. I was just, just going to say that I'm sort of getting the impression that if there was CES in 1830, these are kind of the flat screen TVs of their time. Where the, where the, <laughs> but this is incredible technology. Nobody ha knows how it works. And, yeah, and in the Paris exhibition, all the, with the CES of the time would be the Paris exhibition. All the people would bring their, uh, their wares and their new inventions there. This won the prize. This is the thing that won the prize. This was the flat screen TV that got very, very thin. The next few years, it went even further. And how do you make that even more amazing? You know, what do you do with that? And I don't know if you can see this okay, but not only was this glass there, this would be, have a second column inside there. So all the mechanics are down here, yet this 
hand would be telling the time. Pretty amazing. The method behind it was uh, this would turn a inner tube, there's not one tube, there's two tubes there, that would turn the inner tube, which turns gears through very thin uh, filigree pieces there. You know, not a big clunky thing. Very thin there, which would turn this back piece of glass and make the hand move. That was an amazing thing. And then after that, it was a two-handed clock. They were able to make it so it would tell uh, time with not just one hand, with two hands. And then after that, <laughs> they had one with a square face. And you can figure that out yourself. A square piece of glass in the front. So uh, really, really clever stuff. Yeah. And yes, to your point, this was the flat screen. This was the cell phone of the time. This caused wonder. It was actually a practical, useful thing. But not only was it a useful thing in the home, but actually created this, you know, the question and, the, and inspired people to think creatively. Right, right. So pretty cool. And then what do we have up, up front here? I know it looks like, you know, this is the precursor to modern robotics. I think we've come a little ways, but. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's right. Um, yeah. If you come see my show, you'll see very advanced robotics, mm -hmm. very disguised, uh, and using robotic technology and uh, and magic technology too. Yeah. So even the people that uh, built <laughs> the, my little animatronic thing in my show yeah. really aren't sure how all the additions we added to it. So right. what I do is I take uh, creators in many different uh, areas and uh, no one person knows the whole thing except <laughs> my team. So right. um, I think they may figure it out, but, sure. but in the beginning that's the inspiration. Uh, this is called the Brass Conjurer. And this is actually signed by Robert Houdin inside. It's in the 1840s, correct? 1840s. Um, why don't you fire it up? So it's the classic cups and balls effect, where the conjurer, the street conjurer, will be doing magic. And underneath the you say, there's dice. He's got balls, so to speak. An egg. Not too bad. What's really interesting, this automaton has kind of a beginning, a middle, and an end because it was built by a performer. It wasn't built just by a, 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 a technologist. It was built by a performer. And you'll see, you can't really hear it, but it ends off with everything disappearing and, and it ends. So it actually has kind of a theatrical a theatrical thing, which is pretty cool. So how were these kind of, um, I mean, I know you said they were shown at like the Paris exhibition, but with the Brass Conjurer, like how were these, were these worked into magic shows or what was the context in which these were presented? This was actually part of another clock. So it would be in people's homes, uh, a wealthy person's home. Okay. As these also would be a practical used thing. We have things built by Robert Houdin, which was which were used in a show also. Yeah. Um, if you also the movie Hugo, about Georges Méliès, after Houdin died, the theater, theater Robert Houdin was passed through many people's hands and eventually ended up in the hands of Georges Méliès, who yeah. at the time of the cinema being created, or the Lumiere brothers, he's the one that credited by taking uh, the cinema, which was almost a magic effect, you right. know, having a train coming. People go, whoa. When Coppola made the Dracula movie, there's a scene where Gary Oldman goes into the, a theater, a magic show, and sees a movie. And the movie was a magic effect. Mm -hmm. And it took a performer like uh, Georges Méliès uh, to combine the, those uh, effects of the cinema into a story form yeah. and make it a story. So, you know, magicians come from a great lineage of storytellers and of uh, taking technology, like we see here, and really uh, trying to move the audience, inspire them, uh, take them on a journey in a unique way. We combine digital uh, innovation that I might see here and you might see here yeah. with uh, kind of analog things right and that's what hopefully will be amazing to people who are thinking in this mindset you know um, we'll take things that happen on your cell phone combine it with magical technology so that it becomes amazing for even uh, you folks is there I mean since you kind of are constantly moving forward do you ever find yourself looking at stuff you've done in the past for inspiration to do tweaks or is it like once it's done you're done with it forever I think you know when things worked after a while you you, you gain strength for knowing you went through the same process it, you know when you're a kid you, you think that once you do something really really hard 
that you know all the answers. And you realize every single time it's hard. It's ridiculous hard. Yeah. And it's true, again, the, the Pixar example is a great example because they've done such genius work, but every single time it, they're back to ground zero. You know, right. And that's exactly what we go through every time. Do you find yourself in the, in this process when you're sort of trying to uh, invent new tricks or illusions? Um, you're actually inventing technology yourself because you're you're building like a platform. And is that something you can then use? Is this stuff maybe you're using that you invented? I don't know in the eighties, but you've readapted it and can reconfigured it, iterated it every year. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's true. I mean, I draw so much inspiration from all of the geniuses that are here, but in the process of reinventing it, we end up with stuff that is new technology, where the creators are really new technology. I try to hold on to that technology and not have you guys get it for a while. You know, eventually, right. five years from now, you know, it'll become accessible. You know, this guy invented the first smart home. I have a door in the museum, which was the first door that was with electromagnets. And it would say entree, you know, have his yeah. name, and, and the door would open with a push of a button. Well, that was a miracle. That was a trick back then. Now <laughs> the whole place is smart homes. Right. It's you know the intelligence of that. It was a magic trick to start. Are there sort of um, so, some really big core key technologies over the history of magic? I'm talking about. So maybe there's three or four things that have really made magic pivot and into like a new direction and, and open up what is possible. Well, I think electromagnetism. Um, uh, the the uh, automatons, you know, the automatons were the rage, was the cell phone in Robert Houdin's time. He took that and a lot of other magicians who were doing uh, chess playing automatons and so forth and combined it with our kind of magic. So taking what was the cool cell phone back then and combining it with an operator, a secret hidden operator that was making that, that game of chess impossible, you know, because you know, have you have a machine actually playing chess with people. Right. But it was using my kind of technology, our kind of technology, combined with your kind of technology at the time. Um, you know, the cinema certainly was a magic effect. Smart homes, things that were, um, was something that is now part of our life, but it was something that made people go, wow, that was amazing. You know, in our show, I'm using applications uh, where magic is happening on people's wrists, on wristbands, in the middle of the audience, changing uh, to everyone in the audience, you know, happening in their cell phones. So when they leave the theater, magic will happen in their cell phones when they leave. So the experience isn't just in the theater. They're, they're, the magic is alive outside the theater. Yeah. So we're really trying to, and we have effects now where magic classically is on the stage or a close-up on the stage. We have magic happening over people's heads in the theater. You know, we're still perfecting it, but yeah. it's like, you know, changing the, even the, the, the relationship to the audience. And that's technology. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm really interested to hear a little bit about kind of the, because you said you use both analog and kind of more modern digital technologies. Do you find it usually starts with one or the other, or you just kind of see the pieces fitting together as you're formulating kind of the illusion in your mind? It, you know, it all, like Chris was explaining, the process is, you know, really, what do you want the audience to experience first, you know? What is the feeling or the emotion or where haven't they gone yet? Where hasn't the audience gone yet? Just like in the cinema today, you know, they're trying to say, what can we do to our audience to, to really uh, give them a, a, the feeling that's new? For me, that my job is to do that on stage. And sometimes the inspiration will come from seeing a method or a technology and the uh, illusion will come from that. But a lot of times it'll come from a, a desired effect. Right. Effect that you want and you'll search for a solution. And the solution, solution might be in that booth over there. It may be in that booth. Um, sometimes that's why it takes years to eventually do things, to find the, the possible solution to solve the problem. You agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, also, it's also like uh, we had an illusion that, oh, the cloth vanish where you search for the music for three years. And I wouldn't do, I wouldn't put it in the show because the music wasn't right, you know what I'm saying? It had to be just perfect, and that right. was like the final piece. And when it came, it came, and it was like instantly done. So how did you discover the music? What was the criteria that you were looking for? You don't know, you know something, you don't, it's, it's like a feeling, it's, yeah. a, it's a, you know when you get it right. And yeah. it's, 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 because uh, I really try to make my magic a storytelling vehicle an emotional vehicle. So if unless things are exactly right, we've been guilty of putting a placeholder in the show, you know right. what I'm saying? Just to right. see how it works. 
but it's very, it's very uncomfortable until it's really, really right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the feeling. All right. Well, I think that's all that we have time for. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Chris. James, I could take it or leave it, but whatever. I'm just kidding. I agree. Anyway, uh, that's all we have time for now. Stay tuned. We've got more coming live from the Engadget stage uh, in a few minutes. Thanks, y'all.